Welkom bij de podcast van Hour of Power Nederland. Je gaat nu luisteren naar de boodschap van Bobby Schuler. De boodschap is in het Engels. Liever met Nederlandse ondertiteling erbij? Bekijk dan de uitzending op hourofpower.nl of op ons YouTube kanaal. I want to encourage you today that God is doing things behind the scenes in your life that you just can't see. And the things that he's doing for you are good. Do not interpret God through your circumstances, but rather interpret your circumstances through the goodness and faithfulness of God. You are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. And may I say, we live in a great universe. Many of us will learn this before before we die, but all of us will learn this the day we die. That behind everything that exists, there's a veil. And behind that veil is a spiritual world that none of us really understand, that is having uh, a big impact on very small things in your life, actually. And we're going to talk about that today. God can break addiction in your life just like that. For some of us, it's a process. But for some of you, he'll just take it away. God can heal people miraculously. God can put new people in your life that you need right when you need it. God can use you to transform history, even though, even though, even though. In the kingdom of God, we recognize that It's inverse of what the world has. The world says if you're you know, good looking and powerful and wealthy that you'll make a difference. But we see in the kingdom of God that God loves to use people that seem weak, people that seem less than, to have a positive and good impact on history. So behind everything that's going on in your life, there's all this stuff going on that you can't see. But you live long enough in a life of prayer, you begin to see how God was working at things all along. I want to get in your mind today that we live in a material world that has a spiritual world behind it. This is not a ridiculous idea. And this is not an idea that's been, say, thrown out by scientists. I think there are a lot of vocal atheistic scientists who will sort of act like this is the agreed upon Rule in the scientific community? Let me tell you, it's not. Find a scientist and just ask them. I remember when I first realized this, I've told this story before, but it had a, a big impact on my life in a, in a big way. I've always had a respect for the academic community, and um, I've always enjoyed school. And No, I haven't enjoyed school. I take that back. I've enjoyed good teachers. There's bad teachers in school, you see. There's a, a mix of both. And I remember when uh, Rich Mao, who at the time was the president of my seminary, uh, I didn't realize how big of an honor it was, invited me to go with him to a gathering of intellectuals at the Harvard Club in New York called Biologos. I got there a little bit late, and it was a surprise because the gathering was a couple hundred, mostly scientists, almost all of them were from University of Harvard or Harvard College, The others were from little universities called MIT, uh, Cambridge, and Oxford. Those are the four universities that represent it. And all of the scientists that were there were Christians. And when I say Christian, I don't mean like Anglican, like the King of England. I mean, when I walked into the Harvard Club, which is something I didn't even know existed, this big building in, in Manhattan, in New York, beautiful building, old place, and they had this big dining hall that they had, you know, reserved somehow. And I walked in, and I saw all of these prestigious evolutionary biologists and physicists, geneticists, astrophysicists, with their hands in the air like a bunch of Pentecostals, singing hymns and spiritual songs in resounding Flat and sharp tones, Irene. They weren't good singers. 
They didn't care. It was so moving to look around and understand that in this group were professors, some of the smartest people in the whole world were a bunch of bleeding heart worshipers. Maybe they had seen something I hadn't seen. In that group were people like the the lady that at the time was running the Hubble telescope, who told me she was an hour power viewer, which is great. If you're still watching, hi, good to see you again. (laughs) Francis Collins, who headed up the Human Genome Project, who has his own testimony of being an atheist and coming to faith after delving into the world of science. And it was so wonderful because obviously to be professors at Harvard, they only had to be intelligent, they had to be good researchers and good teachers. And many of them were giving speeches and you know, lectures and such. Francis Collins, he said like, that, that we scientists have been climbing this mountain and now as we're making these revolutionary discoveries in the 20th and 21st century, we get to the very top only to see a bunch of theologians who have been sitting there for a thousand years. <laughs> The remarkable thing is that when people study things like these smartest people in the world, many of them come to the conclusion that there's a spiritual world behind the material world. And that that spiritual world is in the loving grasp and hands of God. If you're listening to me today, don't listen to smart people who seem to know everything about you and everywhere your life is going to go and it's not good. Listen to me. Listen to me. God knows about your future and your life and he cares. Very often when we start to do things the world's way, we start to mess up or delay the good things that God has in store for us. And so today we can relax, we can know we're forgiven, that we're loved, and begin to pray in a way that we actually believe this stuff. That we really believe God is behind the scenes doing a good work in your life, and he is. Uh, I've I've done this before, but... uh, I need uh, like four or five choir members, whoever you are. Let's see if it's the same people from the first service. It can be a new group. It's whoever you want, but you're going to be sitting for about five minutes. All right, anybody? Four, five, six. Steph is bowing out on this one. It's all dudes. Just come here. Just Just come sit. Face the screen. So I've showed you this before, but it's good to remember. This is Plato's allegory of the cave. Plato is trying to describe his view of the world and the universe. And he says, in this bizarre cave, there are a bunch of men and women, just people, uh, that have been chained, that were sort of born here, and imagine their backs are against a wall. And what they're seeing are reflections on a cave wall caused by a fire that's behind them. But they don't know the fire is there, and they don't know that various objects and people are there. And what they do is they all sit here. Hello, Mr. Strange. And they're all, they all sit here, and they debate what these shadows are, and in their view, this is reality. You guys you want some blocking, you can kind of point and you're talking to each other. And you look like a bunch of dummies because you're like, this is reality, this is the real life. And Plato says that all of a sudden, a man's chains come free, a man wearing a blue jacket is too small for him. And he <laughs> turns around. <laughs> he turns around and he sees the fire and he sees these objects, he sees these people and he's like, whoa, wait a second, what's going on here? And then he sees a pin of light on the far distance and begins to walk towards that light. And it's actually the opening of the cave. And he goes outside and he sees all this like amazing stuff that he's never even heard of before. It looks similar to the shadows, but it's better. It's better. And it's amazing. It's the sun. He's never seen a sun before. Birds and a tree. Mountains, grass. Keep in mind, he doesn't have a word for the color blue. He doesn't have a word for tree or bird, only things that kind of link to stuff that we've seen in the shadows. And so he finds this whole new amazing life that until this moment was hidden to him and had heard about but just thought was ridiculous. So he's living in this place full of joy and full of life. And Plato says that all of a sudden he gets a ping of guilt because he, he remembers his friends in the cave and he wants to go set them free. So he goes back to the cave at some personal risk, goes into the cave, and keep in mind, imagine it's a bright summer day at noon and you walk into a deep part of a cave. What happens? Imagine going into a dark room, for example. What would happen? Your eyes haven't adjusted, and so as he walks in, he trips, and all of his friends laugh at him. (laughs) 
because he can't see. And then he tells them, my friends, these things you're seeing on the, this is just a project, it's not real. This is not real at all. There's something very real and it's out there. But he can't even see his friends. He can kind of see things around. He's trying to describe trees and mountains and things, but he doesn't have words for it. So he's saying like, there's this color and it's not yellow and it's not black. It's, it's like somewhere in between, but brighter and somehow prettier. And all of his friends just look at him like he's crazy. Okay, thank you guys. So Plato's cave is a, is a look into Plato's view of the world. It's actually foundational to, to, Western, to, to, to Western education, actually, because within it is skepticism. And the skepticism isn't just towards the pantheon of gods. The skepticism is also towards a naturalistic view of the world. Remember, in Plato's day, it's like the whole earth is flat, and this is a, sort of a scientific view. Of the world. Everything under the earth was water and everything above the earth was the sun and the earth was fixed and the sun was moving. And it caused this way of thinking is like, what if we look deeper? What if we look under? What if we look over? What if there's something behind? And Plato believed kind of in a God, in a one God, like a monotheist. I don't have time to get into it now, but it's, it's key to understand that many of us... Um, that I would say this. There's one of three perspectives of the universe. One, of what we know, less is true. Of what we know, we're exactly right. Or of what we know, more is true. Who here really thinks that everything we know is exactly the amount we can know? And most of us don't think there's less. Isn't that great? So I believe that the despair that so many people are facing today is the sort of flatness of a materialistic view of life. That all that there is is all we can know and that there's nothing underneath. And I know, I know that there's more and I know, although it can be vague sometimes and religion doesn't give us all the answers, that there is built inside of us a desire to know more about that deeper part of the spiritual world. And so much of our despair comes when we're out of touch with that world. And yet when we look back, we can, many of us can see many ways in which God worked in spiritual ways to change material things in our lives. And by the way, many Christians make this mistake too where it's only about studying, reading, it's only about listening to sermons, but not about really walking in its power now. Maybe there's somebody here that really wants to walk in this. The first thing we have to do is, one, believe, and you can almost, can you feel it? Like if you close your eyes and you kind of just, there's, I can do this, and maybe you can't, but you can feel it. If you just stop for a second, you can feel that world under the world that we're in. It's there. And, and things are happening right now in your life. So when we pray, we can understand that that spiritual world is under the con- complete control of God. It's the kingdom of the heavens. And that God is at work in all, all the aspects of our life. In other words, we can be hopeful people and for good reason. In Luke 10, Jesus sends the apostles out They've been studying under him, and now they've come under his authority and power, meaning that they believe that what he says is true, and they begin to act on it. They actually begin to love their enemies. They actually begin to trust in dark times, that even though it seems in the natural this boat is going to sink, that maybe Jesus taking a nap isn't a bad idea. They begin to not worry. They begin to grow in power. And so he sends them out. And when they come back, They say that they were doing miracles like he was, and they were even able to cast out demons, which I know is a word that can mess with some of us. Hopefully I have time to talk about that. But they were able to cast out these dark spirits. And Jesus says to them, in that moment, behold, I saw Satan fall from the heavens like lightning. Quick observation. Jesus doesn't say that after the crucifixion or the resurrection. He doesn't say it on Pentecost. 
He says it the moment his disciples decide to believe and walk in the authority he gave them. The, your body is the greatest touch point between the material world and the spiritual world. Your body is the greatest touch point between the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens, and this world that everybody else experiences. When they began to walk in his power, that's when Satan fell. Because they just really believed it and they really just tried it. In your life, it's easy to feel like, what, is, any of this real? like is any of this real? Is God really doing anything in my life? And so often, all we have to do is posture our bodies in a way that we want to also not, not just, you know, not ignore what's happening to us, but also ask the Lord, what are you doing? What, what are you doing behind all of that? What are you doing behind what I can see? And if we can give ourselves spiritual ears, we can understand sometimes what God's doing, and it's good. It gives us hope and gives us peace and allows us to walk every day in, a, in an unhurried, in the unhurried yoke of Jesus. Think about this for a minute. Um, we have all sorts of passages of demons or dark spirits that seem to have influence or seem to burden people. I want to be careful and not assume that, for example, because my son has epilepsy, he's possessed by a demon. Or because you have a depression or, or an addiction that you're possessed or governed by an evil spirit. But I also don't want to rule out that you're not. I know there are people who struggled with things all their lives for years and years, and one day... They prayed, you know, they prayed millions of times, but one day God just took it away from them. I know that. I hope that gives you hope. Addictive behavior. I met a girl who, she, she went in and out of her struggle with heroin, and then one day the Lord just took it away from her. It's hard not to think, and maybe I'm wrong, that there's something very spiritual about that. And, and I, the reason I hope that gives you hope is don't feel guilty or don't feel like, oh, I have a demon in my life, but also feel that there might be a spiritual aspect, maybe it's not a demon thing, but a spiritual thing about this that God can handle. And somehow, like the Chinese finger track I talked about last week, it's only when we're at peace with, with these things in our life that they actually go away. It's sometimes, it's only when we're at peace with the fact, I can't handle this thing on me. I, and even still, I'm worthy of love and belonging even still, I can do good things in this world. Even still, God loves me. Even still, and there's something when you really believe grace and you push into the Chinese finger trap instead of trying to pull your fingers out, somehow that's what you need to unlock, some of us, to unlock your destiny. In the book of Acts, Paul, there's a story that Paul has this little girl. She's like six to ten years old, and it says that she's a fortune teller. The word there is that she has a python spirit. And the reason they said a fortune teller is a python spirit was, the, was like the oracle of Delphi. This is one of the most famous places in the whole ancient world. Everybody wanted to go here. In order to see the oracle, you had to pay the equivalent of tons of money. And they, they would have an, a slave girl in there who was bringing in, breathing in ethylene. She would get high and then she would speak a prophetic word over you. But keep in mind that the belief was that there was a python spirit a snake, a serpent. What did that sound like? That there was a serpent giving her these words, you see? And that that serpent, in this case, was from Apollo. That Apollo, who was this great god, slayed the serpent. And actually what was happening is that serpent, the decaying smell of the serpent was coming up. And that's what gave this girl her, her words. In other words, that the girl was possessed by either Apollo or this python. When Paul sees that, he just commands it to get out of her life. Get out of her. Get out of her. Boom, it's gone. And she is completely set free. And her slave owners freak out because now they no longer have like a little oracle that they can take around and make money from. And so because of this, the, the leader of Philippi takes Paul and Silas, puts them in the deepest part of the prison. Over them, they put a chief jailer who gets paid extra for their brutality. And they're in the stocks. They've been beaten and whipped. 
it's pitch black, you can't see anything. And in the middle of all that, Paul and Silas are just worshiping and praising God. Here's how I've often heard that passage taught. I've often heard it like, when you go through tough times, you know, try to worship God. Try to worship God harder or something like that. But that is not what I see when I read the text. I don't see Paul and Silas trying to do anything. They're not faking anything. They have seen God work in their lives so many times, they're just not worried about it. They're just assuming somehow God's going to, it's an assumption. God's going to use this to do something great. Great. They're not faking anything. They're not pretending like they're not bleeding. It's that the reward is so, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast, a YouTuber. And like, I saw this thing where these kids, they had to stand up in a circle and whoever was the last one to win got a million dollars. And there they're all standing for days, struggling, horrible, right? You think they'd be depressed. And they're all like laughing and high-fiving and having a grand old time, even though physically they're struggling. Why? Because they know a reward is coming. You think that didn't factor for Paul and Silas hanging there in the stockades? They believed that something amazing was about to happen. So they're just going to praise God in advance. There is a difference between that and you going through a hard time and just being, I'm going to worship God through it. Maybe that's a good thing to do. But I want to say that their praise was a result of something they really believed. They really, really believed it. When you're in your deepest moment, can you promise me something? Promise me that you will quiet your heart, that you will rest, and you will just ask the Lord, Lord, help me trust that even though the worst thing in my life has happened, I can trust that you will turn it to good. Lord, let my life be a testimony that there is no tragedy that is outside of your good hand, that there is no child that is outside of your loving gaze, and that there is no story that is not yet unwritten. Remember what C.S. Lewis said? He said, we cannot go to the beginning and change how everything that happened, but we can start where we are right now, and we can change the ending. Pray, Lord, do a good work in my life. It's been hard at this point, but I trust that no matter what I see in the material, I believe that behind the curtain firmament of the universe, there is a spiritual world at which you are doing good works on behalf, on behalf of me and the people I love. I will just trust it. The same way I trust when I turn a light switch on, that electricity will turn on. I don't know how to make electricity, but I will trust that in that same way, if I look to you, Lord, you'll sort it out for me. And he will. And does he love you so much? He loves you. Things are going to be okay, my friend. We can be at peace today. And we can ask that that, that through all these tough times, God would give us the kind of power that Paul and Silas and the disciples had, that we begin to see um, a real trust and work in that world. So, Father, we love you so much. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you transform our hearts and minds into the image of Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Bedankt voor het luisteren naar de podcast van deze week. We hopen dat deze boodschap jou heeft bemoedigd. Wil je meer weten over Hour of Power of dagelijkse bemoedigingen ontvangen? Ga dan naar www.hourofpower.nl